evening, everyone. First of all, I want to thank Kevin for the beautiful uh, welcome and for the privilege of gathering on your traditional territories. Um, and Kevin's words are a great segue into our conference theme because of his um, suggestion that we spend time reflecting on what we're doing and taking care of ourselves. And those are very important elements of our conference this year. So first of all, I want to thank the conference organizing committee. Um, my colleagues over here, Kyla Epstein and Jorge Cardenas. Can you stand please so that the group can see you? <clears throat> It's been a great privilege to work with Jorge and Kyla on this year's conference, and our conference theme, The Future by Design, is an intentional one uh, and an invitation to our large and diverse library community to spend some time uh, reflecting on the choices we make as we design libraries and as we design library services. We know that our libraries and our services um, and our connections with community can really influence the communities around us. And those changes and influences can roll up into larger social changes. And so um, the, the ripples of our actions uh, are very, very wide. And it's important for us to be intentional and thoughtful in the choices that we make. So this year, we're playing with the idea of design thinking um, and using concepts like uh, brainstorming, prototyping, testing, and iteration to reflect on how we deliver library services, um, a sector that's under tremendous change and within that change, potential for tremendous innovation. So I'm excited to see the conference proceedings this weekend, or this week, pardon me. Um, but before we do that, I want to thank uh, the BCLA board who makes this conference possible, and also to Annette DeFavory, the executive director and her staff, and our colleagues at uh, DC events uh, for the incredible hard work that they do to put on this conference each year. So let's just take a moment to thank them. <laughs> Thanks are also due to our many sponsors. And tonight's keynote is sponsored by UBC Libraries, who is a platinum sponsor of this conference, um, sponsoring tonight's keynote, but also being a long-term supporter of this conference. So I'd like to welcome Ann Olson to the stage from UBC Libraries. Hello, everyone. I'm Ann Olson. I'm the head of the Kerner Library, which is the Humanities and Social Sciences Library at uh, UBC Library. And I'm also a former board member, BCLA board member. I say former um, as of a few minutes ago at our AGM. Um, so uh, it's really a privilege to be here with you all today. And I'm here on behalf of the UBC Library University Librarian, Susan Parker. Susan was unable to be here today as she's in um, Minneapolis right now, attending the spring meeting of the Association of Research Libraries there. And she asked me to um, say how sorry she is to miss this conference this year, um, but to wish us all the best as we uh, get started this evening. And that we're very pleased to be uh, sponsoring this event. One of the, one of the um, key pieces of work that Susan's leading us through right now at the UBC Library is um, a strategic framework um, planning process. And that's our current effort to think about designing and redesigning the library, reshaping the UBC Library for um, now and the future work that we're going to be doing. And a really key part of that work that we have been doing to develop the framework is um, thinking about community. So what work do we do now? What communities are we a part of now? What does that mean in this particular moment in time for us at the UBC Library? And then how will we be working as a community, in community, and with communities as we go forward into the future? Um, so knowing how key and central community is to the work that Vanessa does and how she creates the most amazing communities and community experiences, we really couldn't be more pleased to continue to support the BC Library Conference keynote speakers uh, and, and in particular to have this opportunity to uh, sponsor Vanessa Richards today. So thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, UBC Libraries. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Vanessa Richards examines creativity in common life. Her participatory arts practice in invites communities to explore life when we turn more towards each other than away. 
She has devised and delivered social arts projects with a number of organizations in a variety of sectors. It's a long list, but I will touch on a few. Universities, health authorities, arts organizations, theater companies, festivals, and the Vancouver Parks Board are just a few. Verse and music are central to Vanessa's interests. At Cardiff University, she earned a master's in creative writing, and her writing has been anthologied in the UK, Holland, the United States, and Canada. She's the founder and choir leader of Van Van Song Society, which some of you may have known previously as the Woodward's Community Singers. And she is the director of Creative Together, a song-based facilitation practice committed to the unique history and future of people of African descent in British Columbia, Richards has been an active member of the City of Vancouver's Black History Month advisory group. Uh oh, wrong page, my apologies. Well, this is one of those nightmare moments, isn't it? As a volunteer member, uh, board member of the Hogan's Alley Society, she has participated in the development of the Northeast False Creek Plan, which formally acknowledges and redresses the erasure and resurgence of Vancouver's African diasporic culture in the original Strathcona neighborhood of Vancouver, which was displaced when the Georgia Viaduct was built. Vanessa is currently the Director of Community Engagement at 312 Maine, where she is helping to transform the former headquarters of the Vancouver Police Department into a new co-working center for social and economic innovation. In 2018, Vanessa received the City of Vancouver's Mayor's Achievement Award for her work in the realm of civic imagination. It's my pleasure to welcome Vanessa to the stage. Please give her a warm welcome. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive it is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the ones and the company we keep. Somebody's taken my pages. <laughs> the company I keep. <laughs> we shall be known by the company we keep. Hello, family. <laughs> yes, it's good to be here with you. Hello, family. My uh, family, on my father's side, comes from Trinidad and Tobago, and it's a very common way to greet strangers and friends. Hello, family. Hello, family, you say to everybody. And it's a beautiful way to be recognized. My life's work has been in the arts, and it's always centered around language, performance scripts, music and lyrics, poetry, particularly interested in transposing poetics into community celebrations and ceremony. And I, I really want to thank Kevin Kelly for your beautiful song and bringing ceremony into our secular lives here. I was raised in the territory of the Squamish, Tsleil Tooth, and Musqueam, and my hunger for ceremony started to be fed in these last decades 
And I feel so grateful to be able to talk about the role of care and spirit and family and ancestors in moments like this, whereas when I was growing up, that wasn't the conversation, but the hunger was there, and I wasn't the only one that, that had it. And one of the great opportunities in my experience and, and in my opinion that this moment of the Canadian state considering its relationship with indigenous people as we explore our futures together and we look clearly and plain facedly at our histories is when we acknowledge what a loss it was to deny and harm people for their ceremonies and for their songs, then we have to keep on staring in the mirror and remember when we said no to our own to our own ancestors' songs and ceremonies. And what a beautiful, beautiful time to be alive to say we can start to remember, we can start to participate. And we've been invited wholeheartedly in so many ways and opportunities to say yes to song and ceremony in our life because that's something all of our ancestors have done. Everybody's in this room, all of your ancestors. And I'm very grateful grateful for this moment and to be alive now at this time with you, Kevin Kelly. Yeah, may the work we do here this evening and in the days forward be good for all of our nations and the place we wanna to be together in as we move forward. I wanna wonder out loud with you about the human family and these temples of the imagination we call libraries. My intention is to share with you some of the ways that I've been inspired by libraries and archives in particular and I hope that my experience and my perspectives might support your own inquiry, might give you something to mull on, hopefully be useful for you in your own inquiry into the role of libraries and archives and thinking and public spaces and with whom do we gather, how and why, and how do we do this future by design. How are we intentional about this moment? My area of interest is in particular with the civic and the personal imagination as it relates to what John A. Powell, who leads the UC Berkeley Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, what he calls the circle of human concern. Included in this circle of human concern is this living planet, this living mother. My lens for today and generally throughout my life, it would seem, is one of inclusion and belonging, partnerships and bridging, and the relationship to self and society. These are elephant seals on the coast of California, just north of Big Sur. They spend most of their lives at sea in deep waters alone. They are totally introverted, doing their own thing, loving their own jam. However, the men come to these shores twice a year to mate and to molt. The women come thrice, one of my favorite words ever. Thrice they come to mate, molt, and birth. And when they meet each other on these shores, they do the magnificent elephant seal snuggle puddle. And they just put their big, I mean, those animals can be like tons and tons, 16 feet long, 20 feet long, some even larger. They're very large. I should have laid down beside them to give you some perspective. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, that would have been hard because the smell of wild, E, um, seals, it was fantastic. It wasn't a smell I'd ever had the chance to smell before. And, and I have to tell you that um, I was stirred that I had the privilege of smelling wild elephant seals because that isn't something, wildness isn't part of my everyday life. And I'm hoping that I can make up for a little bit of that tonight. Um, and, uh, but, it, but especially as we think about, well, I'll get into it a little bit more, but the latest UN report on biodiversity and how is it that we care for ourselves and ourselves as planet, because we are human, but we're actually earthlings, like the seals, like the plants, 
we spring up out of this earth. And we know she's our mother because she never lets us go. You can call that gravity, but you could also call it motherhood. In thinking about Canada's relationship to Indigenous sovereignty and, and decolonizing my own mind, I'm really inviting my worldview to be transformed. I want to remember wiser ways. I'm considering not only who is not at the table when I do my work, but what tables am I not sitting down at? In what ways have I silenced myself? In what ways have I internalized a colonization that asks me to play small? Where do I place limits on myself? Lately, so I'm a little, I don't know, maybe sentimental or something like that, but I have my great-great-grandmother's tea towels. And I realized recently, I'm saying, boy, I think, I realized, I kept thinking I've got one great-great, one great-grandmother. But it's only because I hadn't thought of the other ones. I didn't have their tea towels. But I have their blood in my veins. Now get a load of this. Okay, there's my math. I'm going to do this math for you. So every person in this room, and certainly for many, many generations going back, has two parents. This is just the mating part, just the physical science. Two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great Great, great grandparents, 32 greats, 64. And if we go back seven generations, again, thinking about what are the ways that I'm being invited to, to really take responsibility for the wisdom of this land and territory that's been asking me to pay attention. If I pay attention to seven generations, if I count the, um, the last seven generations, that would be a great, 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 great grandmothers and grandfathers. That's 128 of those in that seventh generation. And if you added those all together, Anybody brilliant at math? Two, four, six, excuse me, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, goes exponentially, 128 and so on, but just at seven generations. Anybody wanna hazard a guess? 254. That's how many parents we have just seven generations back. That's seven generations. That's somewhere around 25 years, that's less than 200 years, give or take. About 200 years, give or take, on either side. 254 people swimming in your blood. And that's the least of it. So when I think about the limits I place on myself, when I think about the women from my, mother, from my maternal side, when I think about the women on my paternal side and the lives that they led, um, how many of them were not alphabet literate, had many other literacies. But the privilege of reading and holding on to stories, what that did, to our oral stories, I think about them and I think, who am I to be nervous about this keynote? <laughs> oh yeah, so what I wanted to do today is really to invite you to um, exercise with me our imagination muscle so that we might be more courageous and courageous in our discomfort and more confident in our discomfort to turn towards each other rather than away from ourselves and each other as we're in this rapid, rapid time of drama. It's very dramatic outside of this room. And our, in, our, our capacity as librarians and people who love language and the people who write language, whether it's a scientific journal or a technical journal, literature, poetry, all the different ways that we've inscribed symbols into thought. For all of you who work to serve ideas and the imagination, I say thank you. And I'm really interested in how our capacity to embed inclusion and belonging can become as genuine as a practice of noticing invitations that are hiding in plain sight. What are the invitations that we haven't recognized? What are the ways that we can keep asking? What have I missed? Who else needs to be here? Should I be at that meeting? May I come to that meeting or just showing up? I don't know how many of you have had this experience where you're trying to expand on your, your attendees at any certain place and we say, well, you know, we invited them, but they didn't come. Anybody heard that? So the invitation that I'm asking us to, to play with is, 
the invitation of when we go to where the people are that we also want to be building relationships with. And the beauty about your profession is that you guys have a space, a long-term relationship, place-based idea that you can keep on encountering people. It's not like a project where you just drop in and out. Your buildings themselves say, we're here, we're part of the community, we're allowed to be here. And you can have long-term, lifetime relationships with individuals and communities. That alone is such a blessing. That is such a great way to say, hey, you know, every now and again, I'm going to go drop into all these other places, these other kinds of community events and opportunities, and just show up and be part of the conversation. And then when you look me in my face and I say, hey, nice to see you again, Kyla. Nice to see you again, Anne, Vanessa. And then you say, hey, we're doing this thing and I would love it if you could come and then I'd be, oh, that would be a pleasure. You know what I mean? This is a nice thing. So I'm gonna show you uh, one of my secret symbols. This is called listening coyote. The, you'll notice the ears are up and the mouth is closed. So when I give you this secret symbol, you'll, um, well, it's not so secret, I've just told you, but what it means is I'm gonna ask for your listening when you do that, because I'm gonna invite you to speak. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna ask you to pair with somebody beside you, and if somebody's short a person, I'm gonna ask one of the people in the back there who might be hanging out to uh, join a pair. So could we all just pair up, just shuffle over to find somebody you need to sit beside them, thank you. This is one of my favorite exercises. It's, um, I learned it from my friend Nadia Cheney, who's a really inspired facilitator in community arts and practices. And the reason I wanna share it with you is because I want you to practice and feel what it is to just keep wondering out loud, and the other person, you're gonna just listen with wonder. You're just gonna absorb, you have nothing to say, you need no comment. All you need to do is pay attention to the person in front of you in a way that feels comfortable for you. And what the person speaking is going to talk about is well, you're gonna close your eyes and spin your head like this, and then wherever your eyes land and something catches them, and it could be very small and minuscule, you're gonna wonder out loud for a minute, and I will let you know when, how long that minute is. I will give you an example first, and also just so you're ready, the person whose name starts with the letter closest to the letter A is the one who will start, so maybe should you guys figure that out? Whosoever's name starts closest to A, okay. Perfect, thank you so much. So this is what happens. You're gonna turn your head around, I'll give you a couple of seconds, and then I will say, begin. I'm looking at that pot light over there, and I'm noticing the um, metal interior, and I'm just gonna wonder about it for, about, for a minute. And I wonder if that is dust. I wonder if that's cleaning solution on that. I wonder if they designed how, ki how much kind of shimmer and resonance would come off of that. I wonder if they anticipated the way that those new lights would work inside of there. I wonder how thick that material is. I wonder if the person who designed it actually ever got to see them in action. I wonder, you see how I'm just going? Just going. So we're just going to rinse out that wonder muscle, that imagination muscle for one minute, and then I will say silencio and we'll pause and switch. Any questions before we begin? Everybody's clear? The person with the name closest to the letter A will wonder out loud for a minute. I'll ask you to spin your head around and then open your eyes and see what it lands on. And it can be a shirt, it can be something close or something far away, okay? Spin your head round and round we go. Excellent. Other direction, eyes closed. Big breath in, open your eyes. Begin. Quick popcorn feedback. What did it feel like to just listen to somebody else wonder out loud? How did it feel? Fun, interesting, thumbs up. Anybody surprised by the things that they heard? How did it feel to be listened to uninterrupted while you imagined and, and figured things out and dug into things. How did it feel to be uninterrupted? Anybody surprise themselves? If you surprised yourself, give me one of these. All right, good. So I invite you to consider that as a superb facilitation for yourself tool when you're wondering about those thorny problems around designing the solutions for these days ahead. There's so many great strategies in the design realm 
Um, I'm going to speak to those a little bit later, but I just really wanted to thank you for taking that minute to play and stretch your imaginations with me. I've been really interested in the civic imagination when one of the biggest ways that it, it occurred to me is when I first went to Trinidad and Tobago Carnival. And that was in about the 90s, and I was just so astounded at the level of willingness and revelry and the way that myth and politics got played out in the public arena. And my life changed. There was a whole other way to begin thinking about making artwork and music, and music that was cyclical, things that were like of their time, things that weren't about just a personal reflection, but a way to reflect back politics. And I come from a punk rock background where I was not so interested in the aesthetics, but the politics, and the, the opportunity to talk about what is happening now in our time. And I have the great privilege right now doing a project that our Jean over here, Jean Bilshin, has been really integral in. And this is a project called 312 Maine at the corner of Maine and Cordova. And as I think about uh, belonging and inclusion in this project, I want to give you just a little snapshot of what that looks like. So I work in community engagement at 312 Maine, and it's a co-working center for people working in social and economic innovation. It's also the site of gross mismanagement of the missing and murdered Indigenous women's and girl, women and girls. And the organizations, some of the organizations, we're in a beta testing stage. Some of the organizations are there. Um, Megaphone Magazine, so they work with people that sell magazines on the street. We have Hives for Humanity, their urban apiary. Um, plan, who partner with families and people with disabilities to secure a future, and um, Brave. This is a new organization you may not yet have heard of. They're developing an app that can go on your phone, but also a wearable, so that if you're a person who uses drugs alone, you can let somebody know, a network of care know that you're using drugs and you will be tended to. There's a beautiful system that they're embedding that's both technology and people-based. And in this project that I've been participating in for two years, thinking about belonging and inclusion, I, I just want to share with you two quick little stories. And it's been a hard gig. Jean can tell you this has been one of the biggest, hardest balls to get rolling for so many reasons around what is it to do partnerships and bridge building together. There's more about that later, too. But, um, but it's a valuable project. And what I learned from it from Spike and from Nicholas. So Spike said, uh, Nicholas said to me one day, before we'd moved into the site, which has now been, we've been on the site a year, we were in the Jim Green residencies and Jim Green had this vision. So some of you will know Jim Green is a former city councilor. He was um, a person who cared a lot about people and especially around housing in, in the east end of Vancouver and, and coined the phrase the downtown east side residents or downtown east side with the downtown east side residents association. And he was a friend and a mentor to me. So we were actually, for a while, and he died in five years ago, we were in uh, one of the housing complexes that he built temporarily before we could get into 312, and a gentleman came in, and I was talking about an art project that I thought I could do in about two months' time. And uh, that's been delayed. Um, Nicholas said to me, he said, you know, Vanessa, I'd really like to do that because I've got to get out of this gig that I'm doing. I'm doing spikes on bikes, and that's a project that the Portland Hotel Society started where they're distributing clean needles to people who use drugs and all around the downtown east side. And he said, you know, before this opioid poisoning crisis, and he was the first person I heard that called it the opioid poisoning, he said, before that, when I was handing out um, spikes, I felt like I was a healthcare worker, and I was really keeping people well and strong. Now I feel like I'm handing out death sticks. And in my mind, I said, I have got to get this project off the ground so I can give Nicholas this opportunity to work with me on this program. As it was, that project didn't happen, but a whole bunch of other things happened to Nicholas. And so he is now one of the speakers at the Megaphone Speakers Bureau. He's been part of an, a really important show called Illicit, where they um, used life, uh, grounded life experience and talking about the experience of drug using and the opioid crisis and the people who care for people who are in the opioid crisis. And they toured it around to Vancouver libraries and community centers. And he's had, I just saw him today when I left 312 and a big smile on his face. And, and I can't tell you how satisfying it is to have a space now that we've been there a year and a project that's long, like to have time and space and engagement around ideas of belonging and inclusion, this is the greatest gift we have, right? It's great to do one-offs and little pieces, 
but the depth and the meat of what we are going to achieve together means we have to stay and be in relationship. Um, Spike was, he works with Brave, the technology for overdose prevention. He had been incarcerated at 312 Maine. He had a very negative experience there. He's currently working with nurses and nurse practitioners in training and also uh, professional development, so when they're in school and also when they're taking professional development, and he's doing anti-stigma work. And he takes them to meet me at 312 so we can talk about this project. And he sits down with the nurses. He comes willingly into that building because he's so dang proud to be able to do his anti-stigma work and to have a building that is beautiful, that is his place of work. And if I tell you, the role of beauty in lives that have been marginalized, kicked to the curb, people who say your life doesn't matter, and that's what we say when we say we're not gonna take care of people on the street. We say, not only will we not take care of you, but every place where you get your services is gonna be ugly. Think of, ev think of how awful that would be. So when we welcome people into our libraries and it's nice and it's beautiful and you know you are giving somebody such a, a validation. Say you too deserve an opportunity to sit in a comfortable chair. Enjoy this artwork. Enjoy a toilet that works. So when we think about these places and these spaces, my friend Camille Dumond, she manages a refugee livelihood lab at Radius SFU. She was also, for many years, a counselor with the Vancouver Association for Survivors of Torture, of which there are many, many in our midst and in our metro van, survivors of torture, and she counseled them. And she said to me, when I said I was going to be talking with you, she said, tell them, <laughs> center the leadership of the people that are most impacted, and know it'll be more work than you anticipated. And your job is to clear the barriers. I also do a community choir at 312 Main. Formerly it was at the Woodward's housing that's on top of SFU. I'd formerly been working at Simon Fraser University in their development of their community engagement office. And I thought, well, I think I should do a choir because that would be a great thing to bring people together. I'd never been a choir leader. I'd only ever been an individual vocalist. And, um, and I didn't sing for a long time. I hadn't been singing for a long time. And I, I thought that was a quite a brave and ridiculous thought, but I did it, and now I've been doing it for nine years. And one of the things that I wanted to experience or hope to generate was the, um, the invitation for people to just stand together and be together in one song. And for me, myself personally, to get over being a good singer, I totally messed up the beginning of that song a little bit. I don't know if you noticed, but it was, I, I formerly would have been like horrified. And I'm like, I taught myself so much by, caring more about the song and the words than, than getting it right. And it's okay for me to make a mistake when I'm kind of nervous. And I learned that by making myself exceedingly uncomfortable to do something that I'd never done before, which was to be a choir leader. And I'm still not really great about a lot of things in choir leading, but I'm awesome in some areas. And there's, there's a choir for everybody. And I invite you, whatever it is that you're doing in your work and your capacity, we don't have to be excellent at every dang thing. I don't know if you've ever seen this book. It's called The Manifesto in Mediocrity. I kind of like it because it takes the pressure off. Not that I took it off before preparing for you today, but there was this, there was this invitation all the time in our society to be really excellent at everything, including music. And only people that are really excellent at things get to participate. But think of, like, imagine if you were only an excellent reader how many poems would be left unread? And the poems don't care how long it takes you to read them, right? They just want to be read. And that's the same with all of these human, beautiful ways that we house and encourage in your temples of imagination. Um, Misty said to me one day, she was living in supported housing in Gastown area, and she left, she gave me a letter and it said, I'm so happy to be singing with you. I used to think singing was just for people in church, and I gave up on God. Coming to choir, I realized that I too am allowed to sing. Sometime I didn't see her, and then 
I saw her and she was in pretty rough shape. And I said, come on back to choir, like you're always welcome. It's an open door, it's very low barrier. My elder brother lives with schizophrenia quite profoundly and since the last 40 years, it's been a very big part of our family dynamic and the blessing of that really difficult situation is that my tolerance for mental diversity is pretty big, which sometimes I have to check it because when I'm doing an open door, I might be much more comfortable than a lot of other people in the room and then it's again, same like with you when you're thinking, I'm comfortable with this, but somebody else might not be. So how then can I keep on thinking about when I'm making invitations to people who are not myself, <laughs> Um, how can I just check in? Are they as comfortable as me? How can I make them more comfortable? So, um, so can, um, Misty was looking kind of rough, really rough, and then, then some months later, she told me, oh, I've started some training. Oh, some months later, because she lives in my neighborhood, I'm in, I'm in Mount Pleasant, she said, I've got a job, I'm a counselor. And every time I see her now, the last five years, she's in good neck, clean, walking in her path just full of her own grace and power and being able to have met her when the days weren't so easy was a gift and so I invite you as your libraries become more and more shelters to more and more people who need more and more love that you just give them all the love you got set up your you know, your protocols and your boundaries and whatever your agreements are, your community agreements, but the richness available for our human relationship is, is again, one of the great things. And we need to work at the speed of trust to risk success. And me, for one, I am kind of also appreciate a good enough for now, safe enough to try. Sometimes people who are using the um, Library of Congress or the Dewey Decimal System might not be um, flexible in all the ways of risk management, but I invite you to invite those who are comfortable to take a lead in those areas. And this is one of the things about um, systems change and looking at the adaptive cycle, which maybe you'll be doing in some of your work today, is that really getting clear about where in the transformational cycle of your of, of life or any program that you're the most comfortable. Are you comfortable like burning the forest down? Are you comfortable tending the new growth? Are you the one that's gonna be looking at how do we maintain these systems now? Or are you the one that's gonna say, this is old, it's time to move. And then being comfortable and okay with that part and then letting it's not just what color is your parachute, but really stepping into your own strengths in the very dynamic field that you're working in. Time for a new slide. 10 minutes. Oh, dang, dang, dang. That's not right. We Close your eyes. <laughs> close your eyes. We're going back. I need to go back. One more, please. Keeping your eyes closed. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, open your eyes. Thank you. So, partnerships and bridging. This is a time for book sense and common sense. A time to embrace not knowing as much as knowing. And a time to collaborate in order to expedite the solutions and the healings required. My experience has been with partnerships between theater and music makers and then also across inter and multidisciplinary sectors like healthcare and education and park boards and some of my most rewarding experiences as an artist was when I took myself out of the arts arena and started knocking on the tables that I wanted to be at and say I want to be at the conversation around the school development in my neighborhood and allowing the kind of thinking and I invite you all to invite artists to your table because we have a all of us have ways of thinking that are all valuable and so when we think about who's at the table we want to think about what kind of thinkers are at the table so the first time I sat up at um uh, I lived for 12 years in the United Kingdom in London in Brixton and there was a school that was very, 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 very challenged. It had been under-resourced. It was an old brutalist architecture building that had been neglected for a long time. It was very ugly. The children had no lockers. They were like uh, English middle school, so that it was like, like grade six, seven and eight, had to carry their bags full of their books all around the whole day. The bathroom was a mess. The girls didn't use it, so sometimes they wouldn't go to school. And it was right in the middle of posh Dulwich which is a very, very expensive neighborhood. And these were children who had come from the wars in Bosnia, Serbia, children who had been 
in through foster systems, very, very difficult situations for them, and they were being kicked to the curb. And um, a colleague of mine, her name is Hilary Cottom, she's a great design thinker uh, for systems change, and she said, what would happen if we made the schools less ugly, functioned better? And she put together a transdisciplinary team of educational psychologists, artists, uh, um, architects, engineers, and we all sat at the table, and I was the artist on board, and my job was to take care of the interior of the building, to talk about the morale, to see what is a way that we can use the imagination of not only the children, but the teachers and the cleaners and the cafeteria task, uh, cafeteria staff. That school went on to not only redesign itself and win almost every architectural award in the United Kingdom and Europe, it's called Kingsdale, it also transformed the education that the children were receiving. So from now being like the worst school in London, it's at the top. And that was design thinking with interdisciplinary teams together. And so I really wanna say I'm excited and happy that you guys are, have made this, um, this GLAM sector collaboration with the archives of, well, you know who GLAM is, I'm guessing you talked all about it this morning. Um, but I, I'm really impressed that we can start to think about what are the ways our institutions share values and have values alignment and that we can do work maybe lifting each other up in this important time of making a world we want to be in together because partnerships and bridging help us uncover and discover new ways and remember wise ways. There's wisdom in archives that libraries might not be thinking about. Museums have something that they understand about how people move through space in different ways. We all have these, these big juicy nuggets and when we can sit in, as in Kevin Kelly said, when we can sit and not be in a rush, what is available for us? The gifts and uh, the gifts are just like low-hanging fruit, and like low-hanging fruit, they're related to um, time and right action for the blossoming, and they can't be forced. Um, let's see. Dang! How come is that me moving it? How's it come? How come it's going like that? Okay. Um, so, partnerships, bridging, and belonging. So one of the things that I'm really excited about now in my own experience, again, working across disciplines, is I've been a member of the Hogan's Alley Society. We are looking at transforming what was a city block home to many black residents and businesses. The viaduct went through it. We've been in conversation with the city of Vancouver for the last two years to look at what a community land trust would be like if we took that land out of the marketplace and built rental housing and a spectrum of affordable housing. What's important is that we have now recently, we received the last temporary modular housing and you will know that temporarily only, temporary modular housing, it's only temporary because it can be moved. It's actually very stable, it's strong. So we had the last unit of temporary modular housing in the province that was distributed. There was some 62 of them, I think. And the city, because of the relationship over time that we've been building, they said, hey, we've got the last one. What do you guys think? Shall we begin a conversation together? And we said, well, yeah, we totally want it there. And so we now have 52 people of African and indigenous descent housed at Nora Hendricks Place on the site where we've been doing this work. And I had at first a concern when we said, well, we're going to put our most marginalized people there. And I thought there's going to be pushback. There's going to be racism. There's going to be anti-povertyism. And I'm quite terrified about what's going to happen when the rest of Vancouver finds out that we've made special housing for black and indigenous people and that we've planned for the whole block. We used to be satisfied with a plaque about seven years ago. There was a plaque, a blue plaque. And that was a lot of labor that a lot of artists, Wade Compton, Stan Douglas, Cornelia Weingarten, she's exhibited about this, the, uh, the story of Hogan's Alley. has been living in the creative imagination of Vancouver-based artists, both African descent and non-African descent people. And so I say that to you. So when you go over the viaduct and you see that white building, tomorrow I'm sitting on a jury and we're going to pick a new mural to go on the side. And I invite you, if you think that it's a great opportunity for residents to do city building together, that you support the project in whatever way feels comfortable to you, you can just write the city council, your own city council, if you don't even live in Van, and just say, hey, listen, I know there's a group of residents that got together with a bunch of other kinds of disciplines and different folks, and they made an intervention about what could be possible for affordable housing and right living in this neighborhood. Um, I wanted to say the last thing around collaboration to about 312, I'm super excited about, we have the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, so the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, some of you will know they're a political organization, to, to an advocacy organization to support uh, Indigenous sovereignty. 
they are on the fourth floor of 312 Main, and they have recently been using what was the former boardroom of the Vancouver Police Department as their own boardroom. So we've gone from police chiefs to Indian chiefs in a site, yeah, in a site where all of the news reports where the police would say, we don't know what's happening, we don't know, we don't, there's nothing going on here. All, so is it actually one of the beautiful things that they've done is that they're actually covering the oak paneling, the very iconic oak paneling, and they're covering it in cedar, they're subsuming it in the cedar, the trees that matter to them. The whole place is filled with trees because the trees, the nature have so much to give us. Um, and what's exciting about the UBCIC library and archives that they have there is that we also house the United Church of Canada Pacific Region archives. And they have been working specifically with the UBC Indian Residential Schools and History and Dialogue Center. So it's the United Church of Canada. So we have all the treaty and political history of a kind upstairs on the fourth floor. The United Church has a social history, also a political history. And there are two different kinds of library. Well, the United Church is an archive. It's not so much a library. Um, and then furthermore, on the ground floor, we have the entire library, the book collection of an individual, an individual fond, I guess it is. Frond or fond? Fond, thank you. Of Jim Green himself. And all his books are in wine crates. And it's like a dream come true for me to think of the moments ahead when these three collections of knowledge will start being available. Well, the two, the two are currently available. We haven't um, lifted up the Jim Green one yet, but being able to make a partnership with some of our educational institutions to reimagine what might this Jim Green library actually look like and how can we design it so that citizens can start having this really beautiful library and archive experience inside of 312, because I am aware of the developments that have been happening with community archives and I'm very interested in how that the Hogan's Alley site, I call it Union Village because it's on Union Street and I like the name a lot. Um, we're going to have a cultural center there and thinking about what is the cultural archives that are going to be available and the kind of libraries that we're going to be able to talk about our place and our region and our story of the diaspora. Um, and uh, what I wanted to say about the UBCIC is um, maybe many of you know about the Brian Deer classification system, but I wasn't aware of it. And I just, again, I felt like, wow, what a beautiful way to think about reimagining how we organize books and ideas relevant to the communities of users. And I just feel like you guys are really doing some interesting, beautiful work in the world. Um, okay, self, righto. That's my brother's girlfriend's child, Javon, on the Coquitlam River. And Annette asked me, she said, like, how do we become the kinds of people that are best served to, to, to serve our community members? Like, this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about. And um, I, I chose this picture of Javon because, again, I, I, I felt like it could illustrate in some ways what it is to keep good company with yourself. And what it is to keep good company with people who lift your ideas up. What it is to keep good company with people who ask you the right questions. We shall be known by the company we keep. Okay, so I'm gonna cut into my question and answer period, just un momento. Um, and the way to do that, this is a very interesting thing to me. Um, so some of you will know that uh, Jean Vanier died yesterday, and he was a person who stood for the rights of people living with uh, neurodiversity and had been generally locked away when he first saw them in 1964 and he wanted to create a new way of living in community, large. And he said, we have to remind ourselves constantly that we are not saviors. I should say that one again, especially for myself. <sighs> we have to remind ourselves constantly that we are not saviors. We are simply a tiny sign among thousands of others that love is possible, that the world is not condemned to a struggle between oppressors and oppressed that class and racial warfare is not inevitable. And the biggest way in my mind that I think that we can start tending to this and make ourselves gird our loins for uh, really addressing the UN declaration or the UN report on biodiversity it came out yesterday, which I don't know about you, but I, don't even, I didn't even know what I was supposed to talk about after I heard that. And I came to this, that it's, Really, it's for us to think about our, our peace. 
end so that we can work in urgent times with a sense of groundedness, that we can work in urgent times, not taking offense. Adrienne Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy book, which is a great book on design thinking and emergent strategy, and one of the biggest things I got from that book, she said, is um, we don't throw people away. It's okay if we don't agree. We're gonna work around that because there's too much work to be done to be throwing people away because we don't agree. And, and to be able to do that is a, a requirement of being peaceful inside. And I'm gonna ask us to close on a song called um, Peace, Salam, Shalom. I'm gonna invite you, oh, I do wanna say one other thing. My friend Carolyn Kamen, she's been helping me when we're thinking about impact assessment as well. This is a l oh, not too much of a diversion here. But um, also I'd be happy to talk on the break about all the other ways that I've worked with libraries, particularly around the disaster planning that we're doing in the downtown east side, because we needed, we're, we're trying to prepare for catastrophe. And if you can just imagine what it will be like when an earthquake or a flood hits the downtown east side and people can't get their diabetes medicine, their mental health medicine, or their self-medication, so you now have hundreds of people dope sick in an earthquake. So part of my work around community engagement has been working with the city of Vancouver to collaborate how we might begin to prepare a community of people starting especially with the folks who have been already doing a network of care in the overdose prevention sites. And I know you are, you're the Hunger Games Library, aren't you? Yeah, so we did this, uh, you're in my notes. Um, we worked with VPL, my colleagues at Britannia. There's four people in a, four organizations in a pilot project. And one of the things that we did, like one of the ways, how do you begin talking about catastrophe that isn't gonna make us just wanna like not react in an appropriate way. And so, can you tell me your name again, please? Ariel, right. So Ariel devised um, a way with Britannia uh, to encourage the teenagers to think about survival with a Hunger Games scavenger hunt. Yeah. And, and there's all, again, all these imaginative ways that we can just start being with the way things are and get it together and make ourselves peaceful, grounded, and collaborative, and inclusive, and belonging. And you guys have every book. You do not need to ask any person of color what should you do about your embedded stuff. You can unpack it yourself in your own libraries and then talk to me and then talk to anybody else and then talk to whoever it is that you want to talk to about what is it we're gonna do together because you guys are, you have the great temples of information. So I just wanted to also say that in these days as we're moving forward with our impact assessment about how we do this work, I hope that on this weekend you will also start to feel inspired about the, the, some of the new and progressive ways people are building impact assessment into their um, processes in these new ways that we're working where we're allowed to fail and it doesn't have to work. Um, and again, that way to approach that is from being peaceful inside. This is a song by um, Emma's Revolution. They presented it at the march on the mall after the Twin Towers came down. And uh, they said they they started writing this song as they were literally driving out of New York City and when that was happening. And they um, then said, okay, we'll sing that song, but we don't wanna just leave the words hanging. We want people to wear the words, peace, salam, shalom. And so after they'd sang the song and they were at the merch table, a woman came and said, hey, what's the biggest t-shirt you have? And they gave her the biggest one they had and she slipped that over her hijab and niqab. And she wore this. And the song sounds like this and I'm gonna invite you to put your feet on the ground. And if you wanna put your purse down. And if you're comfortable, you can join me. If you're not, you don't have to, no pressure. Um, but we're gonna split down the middle. We're both, we're gonna learn it all together a couple of times and then we're gonna sing it and then we'll be done and I'll walk off like a little fairy from the stage on the soft music of the librarian singing. <laughs> and um, no, actually I'm here for questions. Okay, so breath in. Um, it sounds like this, I'll sing it for you once and then just join in. And I do invite you to keep yourself, um, to give yourself the privilege of this experience and the medicine of the music. Peace, salam, shalom. 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 
Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. Won't you try it with me? Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. Nice. Peace, salam, shalom. What do we need? We need peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. You're beautiful, nice. Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. With a big breath now, we go bam. Peace, salam, shalom. Very nice. Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. And then you guys are going to do it. Peace, salam, shalom. And you guys will wait. You keep going. Peace, salam, shalom. Very nice. Peace, salam, shalom. We're going to start from the top. Here we go. Peace, salam, shalom. And listen to each other. Peace, salam, shalom. And let the peace be in you. Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. Shalom. You can stand up. Peace, salam, shalom. How do you feel about trying it standing up? Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. What do we want? We want peace, salam, shalom. Who are you? You are peace, salam, shalom. Who am I? I am peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. One more time, everybody. Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, salam, shalom.